uh, many times um, when you think of your adversity as being too big for you, then that's when you self-defeat yourself. And that's why you must always enter every scenario with a full ounce of confidence. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia falco Bekali, your host. Do you sometimes look at the rich and famous, beautiful and powerful and think, wow, how did they make it? How did they get there? Did they get everything just handed to them on a silver platter? Oh, wouldn't it be nice to just be like them? But I think we all might be falling into the trap to just look at the tip of the iceberg. And what we sometimes tend to forget is what is underneath there. All the hard work, the grind, the against all odds, the resilience we need to turn negative into positive. And this is exactly what we want to talk about today in today's episode with Reggie Williams. He's an NFL legend. He's also a, a graduate from Dartmouth. Ivy League College, a former Disney executive, as well as an author of the book, Resilient by Nature. Reggie, so good to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me, Patricia. It's a treat to be on. Well, you know, um, reading your book, I really read it cover to cover, Reggie, and I can only say one thing. First of all, compliments, because you had a wild life. It was a ride <laughs> interesting so so interesting uh, in some respect what one might expect from a successful personality like you in other respects really really surprising it was tough for me to say okay do i now go chapter by chapter because every chapter is gold or do i go by themes and i decided why don't we have the conversation about resilience and about your book and your own life following themes and values and before i ask my first question let me share a sentence with you on the screen share, not only with you, but also with our community and kick off our conversation. Now, that's the screen share. This is what I would like to see is life will surely test the will in all of us to face adversity with determination or quit. And these tests present themselves in all types of situations. That's from your chapter four. The reason, yes. yeah, the reason, Reggie, why I pulled this one out was my first question to even your title is resilient by nature. Is resilience really by nature or is it nurture and it's something that you develop facing hard times? Well, you know, the, the title uh, doesn't try to capture all the nuance of what the book is trying to convey. Um, the collaborator in the book, uh, Jared Bell, uh, and I were initially titling the book Boomer, which was uh, the name that I earned my very first day of Dartmouth College and had to live up to. But by the time we got close to having to publish the day, the book, it was obvious that there were so many books out there called Boom or Boomer that we needed a new title. And as we explored different titles, um, Jared came up with the concept of... Uh, uh, but trying to look at soul groups that sort of had meaning to us. And so he said, wow, naughty by nature, but you're not naughty, you're resilient. And I said, you're right. So the resilience that he picked out of telling my story time and time and time again, uh, even before I even knew what the word resilience meant, uh, I was doing it. And so that's why, you know, that uh, quote, is so impactful because um, your adversary, you know, in this case, let's call it alpha dogs, the, the ult ultimate uh, competitor, the ultimate enemy, the ultimate uh, hurdle to you achieving your success. Uh, many times um, when you think of your adversity as being too big for you, then that's when you self-defeat yourself. And that's why you must always enter every scenario with a full ounce of confidence. 
Well, I think that is an excellent word, confidence. Confidence and just the mindset of saying, okay, I know these are alpha dogs, but I'm an alpha dog as well. Is that something you develop? Or is that something that you just plant in your brain and then as you think, you act? Well, in the circumstance in the book, um, adversity was on me so quick and my options were so small that the only thing that I had to rely upon was myself. Uh, there, were, there were no one else that could come to my assistance. And uh, knowing oneself, uh, knowing the power of uh, your self-determination is going to be very important in circumstances because the reason I survived that first most dramatic uh, pack of wild dogs in Mexico was because I showed no fear. They were seeing an adversary that didn't fear them. And in the absence of language, because I didn't trust my Spanish enough to really try to talk my way out of a pack of dogs. Well, I tell you one thing. Have your self-confidence, yes. Absolutely. I tell you one thing. I loved that description of it. And I just thought, oh, my God, you know, with your background, with the values that also your dad instilled in you in academic excellence. Now, if you need to be academically excellent, what you do is you prepare. And I felt when you went to Mexico, you went like so blue eyed. You didn't speak the language. You didn't have a clue what the family, who you're going to meet is going to look like. No telephone number, nothing. And you were stranded and you survived. It was a learning experience. Well, to say the least. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's a building block. Because many of the things that I've accomplished were preceded by the complete unknown. Uh, When I went to Dartmouth College, completely unknown. There was no one else from Flint, Michigan, or anyone from Michigan, as far as I knew, was at the college. I was all alone. When I went from Dartmouth to the NFL in Cincinnati, I had never been to Cincinnati before. Never knew what my potential for being a NFL player. And then I end up 14 years there in the city councilman while I'm still playing. So life after that became another set of unique circumstances. I go on to happily accept the job at the New York, New Jersey Knights to be general manager of a World League of American football team. And then the NFL takes it all away. And uh, that led me to NFL Youth Education Town because it was an opportunity to uh, help uh, Super Bowl Twenty Seven. Yeah, and you're way into your career already. Let's backtrack because there's so much interesting stuff I want to dig deeper into. Let me quickly interrupt the conversation to say thank you that you are here with me on the channel. If you do enjoy what I'm putting out, the in-depth kind of conversations, then why don't you subscribe and also hit the bell button so I can keep you informed with our newest releases. Thanks for that in advance and let's get back to the conversation. So much interesting stuff. I want to dig deeper into Reggie. And that is, again, circling back to, you know, facing tough, tough situations, but standing there and being resilient. And that is something that I felt your family really instilled in you. You come from a very loving, uh, caring background, uh, a background where your dad sacrificed a lot. Both of your parents sacrificed a lot. But I think when you... (laughs) That was also very interesting to see how you kind of like chose to go to Dartmouth because you wanted to be a doctor. You didn't want to be an athletic star or one of the great managers at Disney and whatever else was presented to you back then. But again, it was kind of a default situation. You stumbled into it and your dad took on a third job to carry, I think, two of you three boys at the same time through university because there was no scholarship for sports at Dartmouth at that time, or at least what you were playing. That is correct. And the reason that Dartmouth became an option, because my lifelong dream was to go to the University of Michigan, be a doctor, had no aspirations of being a professional athlete. All I wanted to do was run out on the field. But the head coach, Bo Schimbeckler, said I wasn't good enough. When I shared that with uh, my father, he encouraged me to not lose sight of my dreams. I can become a doctor at Dartmouth, perhaps even more, and I can still play football. But the chip that uh, Bo Schimbeckler put on my shoulder, uh, the fact that he didn't believe in me, 
that he was taking away a lifelong dream. That really created unique inspiration once I did get to Hanover, New Hampshire and become a big green player for Dartmouth College. Again, you had a negative, a no, a rejection, and you just said, I show you in a different way, but I show you. And, and let's move on from that one, because I think when it comes to really becoming a you know, successful athlete, focus is something incredibly important. Authenticity, focus, and just being staying with the task if you want to go to the top. And let me there share the second screen and the second quote from your book, which I found very relevant because it really touches on a lot of potential people's lives and choices. So that was the first quote. This is the second quote. This is a bit longer, and I'm going to read it out from my paper. Rhea Gordon. Pretty, Rhea Gordon. Yeah. She was a gorgeous, exotic lady from North Carolina whom I dated. Her nurturing instinct was special. I'm thinking, I'm going to have to let her go. It shocked me. Let her go? There was an element of me saying, I can get used to this. I can marry her. I can quit everything else and be totally satisfied with her for the rest of my life. But that threatened the focus I needed to have to get back on the football field. I knew that as long as I was with her, I'd be thinking about her. Now, listen, we all have made choices between career and love um, in the past, I guess. And when I say we all, I often uh, refer to women as well. What was it like that moment when you had to really say, okay, what I choose? Do I choose the comfort, the nursing, the nurturing, what I know maybe from my mommy or being in a way without that support system, without that love, but go for the discipline, the harshness, the, you know, against all the moments that you faced then during your NFL career? Well, that moment is still one of those clear moments in time. I still remember it, and it just shocked me uh, as I verbalized it, that I've got to let her go, uh, because uh, love is such an overpowering emotion. Um, but I hadn't, go I didn't go to Dartmouth to fall in love. You know, I went to Dartmouth to focus in on opportunities that were uniquely there before me academically and now athletically because of what I had done my freshman year. I had potential and the team needed me. They were 0 and 3. And uh, my focus needed to be on the contributions to the 100 people in the locker room that I was playing with versus one beautiful, exotic woman that I could have could have fell in love with for the rest of my life if that's what my life was only going to be. I, I think it is. <laughs> you know, I, I faced this kind of moment, and I made also choices where I wanted to do one thing, and then my then-boyfriend said, well, if you're going to do this, then I'm going to leave you. And because of that, that was a bifurcation in my in my life. I did something else, which was – even greater, even better, but still I went for the other choice because I didn't want to lose that person in that moment. And I think it is so mature and a tough decision in that moment to really tone down the emotions and look long-term and also uh, think about the responsibility you took on, A, being privileged to go to an Ivy League college and B, also towards your teammates, your classmates, et cetera. So I think that is excellent. And interestingly, you carried that on. And now we're going to jump a little bit to a time warp here, Reggie, when in chapter 10, you talk about when you become the sports director at Disney to, to build that fantastic athletic complex, wide world, wide world of sports, I think, where <laughs> you didn't allow the Mickey Mouse theme of Disneyland to be any part of that project or the branding of it. Again, you put your foot down in front of eyes and the then CEO of Disney saying, no, we need to stay focused. It needs to be clean. Athletes need that. No distraction. Yes. Authenticity was my focus at that time. And, you know, decades later, now that ESPN Wide World of Sports has hosted the NBA championships, they had uh, the whole completion of their season. I think there were 72 televised games. 
And not one game did they have Mickey Mouse there. Not one game did they share their stage of authenticity with inanimate created cartoon characters. And that was my whole focus for kids. You know, their uh, sweat and their effort um, to compete in authentic uh, tournaments and sporting events uh, on authentic fields that celebrated all of their bravery and courage. Um, I didn't want that to be minimized uh, by virtue of having uh, a character. And so the characters are available in the theme parks. Uh, we encourage all of our guests to enjoy all the things that make Walt Disney World the happiest place on earth. But on the football field, we want to celebrate excellence. We want to celebrate winners. Exactly. And, and what I thought was so interesting, you said about that part of your life, that this was, personally speaking, the most satisfying. Why, if you compare what sort of legend you were at the NFL as a linebacker? Well, you know, uh, kids' dreams will last forever. Same as mine. You know, part of what drove the desire to build a sports destination for kids all over the world was because one of my lifetime dreams once I did play NFL football was to be a champion. And when I did lose twice in the Super Bowl, it created a, a series of nightmares uh, because, you know, you'd wake up, you know, thinking that you'd won the game and had to live with the pain that you lost and the, the confidence your fans had in you that, you know, you let them down. And, um, and so I wanted a place where kids could learn how to win with class but also lose with dignity. Mm -hmm. And that is the lesson that uh, hopefully forevermore, whenever kids compete at Wide World of Sports, they'll know that because they've seen world champions compete there. They saw the Los Angeles Lakers. They saw the Miami Heat. They saw the pain of losing. They saw the players get back up from losing and continue their life at the happiest place on earth. And, and losing is such a key word. Let's pick up on losing because losing has really triggered something. You mentioned that, you know, your team lost twice at the Super Bowl and there was one key moment. You came back to Cincinnati and despite that loss, you were really celebrated and that triggered something fundamentally in you where you felt, I want to give back. This is wonderful. I need to be there for my community. Can you elaborate on that part of the book? I think it's chapter seven. Well, you know, after we um, lost uh, the Super Bowl 16, and also, quite honestly, my uh, performance that year playing um, was such that it didn't get all of the individual accolades that I, I felt it needed. I really uh, refocused all of my energy on the citizens of Cincinnati. I wanted them to know that I wasn't just a mercenary coming through to play a position. I was coming there to make Cincinnati a better place. And I doubled down on all of my community involvement, started a scholarship fund, uh, became um, known as a person that spent more time with kids than I spent with uh, my teammates. But it all led to being accepted as a Cincinnati city councilman as a role model for all time for kids. And to really now, when we talk about the importance of voting, okay, action does speak louder than words when you're a pro athlete who is actually a pro uh, a politician um, in a good way, bringing good trouble, uh, but a politician in a good way uh, to tell kids the importance of civics and responsibility to your community. And then you became also part of uh, the public authorities there for quite some time, which, you, which was a big part of your life and a real, a real satisfaction for you. Yes, it was. Uh, you know, uh, my wife at the time, she was from Cincinnati. Her parents were uh, both from Cincinnati. Her father was the first African-American professor at the University of Cincinnati. Her mother was a... a um, a opera singer. Uh, they were an interracial, very um, famous um, couple in Cincinnati. And um, when, uh, 
you commit to a community as I did, then it's really all or not. And um, you want to be known as a successful uh, athlete. You want the teams to win, but you also even prefer to be known as a great a neighbor and a good citizen. Absolutely. And again, let me let me share a screen and a quote from your book there for everybody to see, because again, that was very impressive. It is not this one. It is also not that one. It is this one. And uh, here, this is from chapter seven principles. And this is exactly what you're talking about. And then we, we go a little bit deeper into what you're trying to say here. Part of the challenge in rebounding from any difficulty is to turn a negative into a positive. Losing that Super Bowl strengthened my resolve to have an impact that went far beyond football. This is where the decision was coming. Empathy humility, passion, integrity, inspiration, commitment. These were some of the characteristics I believe that needed to define me to the people of Cincinnati more than tackles, sacks, and interceptions. It's one thing to be a leader for one of the best teams in the NFL, but it became just as important, if not more so, to be a leader in our community. That was yes, when I was growing up, I had leadership. And it was a time where we needed leadership. Um, you know, I was born in 1954, and here in the United States, uh, that was the year of the Brown versus Board of Education. And uh, my first hero was Third Good Marshall. And um, through all of these scenarios, uh, education has been the foundation by which uh, I could uh, um, have hope. And uh, one of the inspirational leaders of uh, my childhood was Martin Luther King. And uh, I had a chance to, you know, hear him and uh, learn about the importance of, uh, of uh, nonviolent protests, which is happening even today. But that's one of the unique things about playing a violent sport is that you can protest violently on the football field to make a difference. And so... Now is the time, the, the, for, uh, the foundation of all of these circumstances uh, where it's important for leadership to really define change. Uh, it's important for change to happen now worldwide because of leadership uh, that has been successful in dealing with the pandemic like in New Zealand and uh, leadership that has been abhorrent in dealing with the uh, pandemic like here in the United States under Donald Trump. And so leadership, you know, is a commodity that saves lives. And that's why it's so important to focus on leadership at every level, even in the community, because it builds up the leadership that we're all living under right now. Absolutely, Reggie. And I'm so happy you brought that up because racial injustice has been something that has been going through all of your life. And I think in 1963, when JFK was killed and also Dr. Martin Luther King did that, I have a dream uh, speech. You know, of course, racial, racial injustice was a big theme. Standing from where we are right now and having been there so many years ago, Reggie, quite honestly, how much has really changed, considering we had the George Floyd murder, considering we do have the Black Lives Matters movement right now in the 21st century. How far have we really become from your perspective? We came a long ways under Obama and the rebound from uh, Obama, the reaction, the racism, that bubbled up, you know, has returned us to the mid 60s. I, I sort of uh, live my life now um, sort of uh, saying if George Wallace, who was the segregationist, the governor of Alabama, who ran for president in 1968, if he would have won, we would have be uh, living the same uh, world that we're living now. And it's unfortunate. Uh, because now there is so uh, much uh, violent guns out there. And that is the concern that didn't exist in the mid-60s. You know, you didn't have normal citizens armed to the teeth as normal citizens are armed now. And so, you know, the concern and the need for leadership has never been clear. 
And, uh, you know, certainly I hope that all of your uh, listeners know that, uh, you know, we do need a change in leadership uh, here in the United States of America. You know, I support the Biden uh, Kamala uh, Harris uh, ticket. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to come to peace with uh, the Trump supporters because uh, we need to survive with them together. But we do need to have our day of reckoning uh, because I, as a person of color, should not be treated differently in my own country. And uh, that is really, you know, the basis of the orientation that uh, white supremacy does have. And since our current president hasn't absolutely stricken down every tenet of white supremacy, then he is not speaking to, you know, the people of color who are American citizens and the people of color around the world who look to America for leadership. I think this is, uh, you know, it brings me back to your book, what you're saying right now, because there were two incidences uh, when it comes to leadership and uh, being an African-American. And that was, first of all, at the uh, NFL itself, that leadership, there was no diversity, something that you also try to bring in. Uh, and also at Disney, when, when Eisner called you to the interview, there was hardly any person of color in the leadership. And then when you became a director, funny story, but really chilling, um, went to the HR department to get your badge and the lady at the HR department wouldn't give it to you because it wasn't just possible that anybody of color would be a director within the Disney realm, within the Disney world that never really catered their marketing to anybody else than, you know, the average white person. That is true. In 1993, when I was hired, I was the first uh, African-American executive hired at Walt Disney World. So of the uh, tens of thousands of cast members, I was the first one that had uh, a level that allowed me to uh, merit uh, stock options and other perks uh, relative to uh, uh, starting a new business. And that meant that not only... Uh, was that an issue for her uh, and the HR department? It was an issue for all of my peers and my boss and the people that I'm dealing with on the other side of the table who are on other companies uh, because I'm not only representing all of the great assets of Walt Disney World, I'm representing all of the legacy of the people who share the same skin color as I do. And I'm trying to make them all proud. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure you did. Reggie, looking back, what were the really the most painful experiences when it comes to the lack of diversity or racial, in, racial injustice you can remember? Well, you know, that first uh, uh, couple of days at Disney, it, it really was challenging. And um, what I saw uh, in the first Traditions film, which was an orientation for all new uh, cast members, Uh, to explain to them the history of the company and how Walt Disney uh, created uh, so much happiness around the world. And one of the keys was uh, Steamboat Willie, which was a Mickey Mouse character. Yeah. And that character was the first character to use sound. And to illustrate that, in this uh, traditions film, they had Al Jolson singing Mammy in blackface. Well, as a black person sitting the audience, I'm like offended, you know, and I, you know, express the fact that, you know, um, his depiction of, of my race is, is not appropriate uh, to continue to convey. Well, they took issue with me bringing up uh, my concerns and uh, they created a little group to study if I was a rabble rouser or was I really trying to help them? And I was, you know, saying, well, I just came here. And, you know, it's not about the sports business, it's about now, you know, how uh, people of color are being represented. And the thing that really saved me was Whoopi Goldberg, of all things. Oh, really? What a parent does Whoopi was dating Ted Danson. And Ted Danson wore blackface to the Hasty, Hasty Pudding Awards at Harvard. And he just got so much negativity for being in blackface and all of a sudden the people at Disney said, wow, Reggie did us a favor. 
we need to organize ourselves around the things that we don't know. And they formed a diversity department. The first one within the company, and that diversity department was the, um, the launch pad for a whole array of new characters, new movies, uh, new investments, new companies, uh, that has finally made uh, the Walt Disney Company one of the most diverse, most well-respected international companies in the world. And that wraps up the first part of my conversation with Reggie Williams, NFL legend and former Disney executive author of Resilient by Nature. I hope you like the conversation. So, and if you do, make sure to subscribe to my channel so I keep you informed when the second part comes out. And of course, with all the new videos as well, you can find us on all the platforms. So I hope you're going to join not only the next conversation with Reggie, but also our community here on Mentor TV.